the uh, elevator design is in the new world's tallest tower. Uh, you've probably heard that it's going to have 250 floors. It really doesn't have 250 floors. That would be if we, we had floors all the way up to the tip of the, uh, the tower. It really is about 167 floors, which is still a pretty, that's a lot of floors. You imagine an elevator with 167 buttons on it, trying to push the buttons. Anyhow, we can't uh, make an elevator go that high, so we've broken it into the zones. And uh, interestingly enough, it's uh, like the two last largest towers. It's a multi-use tower. So you, the, the beauty of multi-use towers is they have a lot fewer people than if it was an all-office building environment. Uh, this is the uh, one of the council tall buildings uh, chart showing the tallest 20 towers in the world. And under this chart, which keeps changing every week, <laughs> our firm designed anywhere from six to nine of the last 20 world's tallest. And uh, so that's our real specialty. We, we specialize in high rise, super high rise, mega high rise, and now the Kingdom Tower will be the world's first ultra high rise, which is over a, one kilometer. A question that uh, somebody in the audience asked Adrian this morning was, why do we build something that big? And uh, I guess the best answer is because we can. <laughs> With the technology, we can do it. And uh, everybody wants to have bragging rights for the world's tallest tower, the world's fastest elevators, the world's highest observatory. And it also puts Jetta on the world stage map. When I first went to Dubai, I was amazed to see the Burj Al Arab they were so happy with that tower when it was first built that they, it was on their license plates on all their cars. Same thing happened in uh, Kuala Lumpur with the Petronas Towers. How many Americans ever heard of Kuala Lumpur until they built the Petronas Towers? And then they, even though they were only 88 stories, they claimed the world's tallest tower. And boy, everybody knew where Kuala Lumpur was very quickly. So the same thing probably will happen with Jetta as soon as the word gets out that this really will be the world's tallest tower. And Adrian correctly pointed out number three is because it uh, uh, increases the surrounding plot values tremendously. So even though they may not make a lot of money on the tower itself, they do uh, increase the value of all the surrounding plots. Plus it captures the uh, Guinness Book of Records for a number of firsts, and I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. The wrong answers were to make a profit, even though the project's only $2.6 billion, it probably will never make a profit. Although the second one there, or the third one, excuse me, to house people and businesses, and the third one is to give tourists a spectacular view, and that view doesn't come free anymore. They actually charge to go up there. Last I heard, the Burj Khalifa observatory lifts, if you, uh, have a reservation, it's $25 to go to the top. And if you don't have a reservation, it's $125 to go to the top. So you can see at those rates, you can make money very quickly. And now I understand that uh, with the uh, Shanghai Tower coming online, it was the observatory is actually taller than Burj Khalifa. So now they're charging you now extra to go to the observatory. And then if you want to go up the local lifts to a higher level, they charge another, I think it's 25 or $40 more. So <laughs> there's a lot of money in going there. The biggest problem you have is getting people to leave. So we're probably going to have to time stamp everybody's uh, ticket because they go up there and they say, I paid that kind of money, I'm going to stay forever. And you can't get them to go. And then another interesting way of uh, collecting revenue off these observatory lifts is when they first did Taipei 101, I was absolutely amazed to see that, yeah, you went up to this pendulum bar and they had the uh, tune mass damper in there and you, you had a drink around the bar and pretty soon you'd be saying, and that thing was moving, you could see the building moving underneath you and pretty soon you'd say, is that thing really moving or did I have too much to drink? And, uh, and then the amazing thing they did on the way out, you went down and you didn't go back to the ground floor where you got on the elevator originally. They let you out at the sixth floor, which happened to be the top of the retail mall. And you have to go all the way down the escalator, so they get some extra money on the way down from the retail. And I, it was interesting to see that the, 
Smith Gill has designed the Kingdom Tower with a retail outlet also. Uh, like most super towers, it has mixed occupancy. So this is the ideal stacking from an elevator standpoint. You say, why, why do we do it that way? It's because you can appreciate that office portion of a building ha requires a lot more, has a lot more population and requires a lot more elevators than does, say, a hotel or residential. In fact, the very top residential has very few people. And so we uh, came up with the total number of people in this building. And, Based on the elevator design, it comes out to about 5,000 people. You'll hear people say, oh, it's going to have 10,000 people or 15,000 people. It doesn't. And there's two things that confuse everybody. One is when they design the uh, life safety requirements for stairs in a high-rise building, you have to use a density that's much, much lower than the actual population. So life safety guys might come up and say, oh, we've designed the stairways for 10, 12,000 people. Where the reality is there's only 5,000 people, by our estimate. So the ideal stacking is the subterranean parking and then podium retail office, and then the hotel and service departments. This is going to have a Four Seasons hotel and a Four Seasons service departments. And then there's six zones of residential. And as you go up higher in the building, obviously, there's fewer people in those units, and they have a lot more. They go from one, I think, two bedrooms up to five bedrooms in the super penthouse suites. Some of them are half a floor. And then the big money maker, the observatory and the sky terrace. And those are served by their own special uh, double deck elevators. And then there's talk about having some restaurants and clubs up there. And then here's another money maker that at the very bottom, believe it or not, these are the best tenants you can get. There's nobody ever there and they never complain. But it generates a tremendous amount of revenue because uh, it's all line of sight. TV and uh, high definition television and uh, Wi-Fi are all line of sight. So the, to get to this kind of height in Jetta is a very valuable proposition. This is a little stacking diagram that shows you the breakout of the various zones. This shows the uh, various stacking portions of the building. Obviously, this subterranean parking is underneath. Not a, not a lot, because if you saw the presentation this morning, you could see that there's a huge raft down there, and you can't go really very deep. I think there's four basement levels. And then you have the uh, multiple entry points, one for the hotel, one for the residential, and one for the office. And then the office space, and then the uh, uh, service departments, and then we go into six zones of residential, which are all served by a set of sky lobby shuttles and then transfer to local elevators. And then the observatory is way up here at the top. And then we have a, actually an elevator and a spire for the communications people. Uh, when we design elevators in uh, any kind of building, we're always looking at peak traffic periods. So. For instance, they vary. In an office building, the peak actually is not the morning up peak, it's the evening out peak when you handle the most people. In a hotel, it's a lot of two-way traffic, so you really don't have really defined peaks. And then, uh, so these are called uh, traffic types from one way up, which you would use for designing elevators in an office building environment, and then two-way balance, which we use for designing elevators in a hotel and a residential environment. And then the big thing is, I told you we have to make some projection on the population. So that's, that's where the talent really lies. It's actually easier to design elevators in an office building than it is a residential where you have multiple mixes. And then we have uh, population projections and then we come up with the local passenger elevators and then how many sky lobby shuttles we need to feed that. And you notice single decks, double decks, triple decks. We are actually looking at triple decks at one time on this project because they wanted to have three definitive people going up to the residentials, but that didn't come to pass. But someday somebody will build a triple deck. There are no triple decks presently, but there's probably a good application for that. In fact, probably Kone with their new uh, hoist ropes, the ultra ropes, could probably do that quite easily. And then. Uh, most projects that we do worldwide now have what we call destination dispatch, and in the office portion, 
and maybe the hotel it's integrated with the building security. So as you walk through, you get your assignment for the lift to queue up in front of, and then the lift comes and you go right to the floor and don't push the buttons. And then the uh, observation shuttles in this particular job are, uh, they're 1,600 kilograms over 1,600 kilograms, and then their speed is 10 meters per second up and 10 meters per second down, which is actually the same speed that are in Burj Khalifa. But these particular lifts would be the world's longest travel lifts. Although there's a rumor that Kone may jump speed up speed just a little bit. I don't know. They won't tell me. And then, uh, obviously, the, this has been constructed for the king of Saudi Arabia. And so um, they have, at the very top of the building, they have what's called royals, suites. So there's some question about whether those people want to integrate with other passengers going up to those floors. And so with Destination Dispatch, we can not only set up which floors you're allowed to go to, but we can also set up a hierarchy of who you are and how good the service is. So obviously, if the the king and his entourage comes in, we would give them express service right to their floors. And same thing coming back down. That's one of the advantages of uh, destination dispatch. And then the service elevators were interesting because uh, we couldn't go high enough so that one, most building codes say one elevator has to serve every floor in the building. Well, they, at this height, we can't do that. Nobody makes an elevator that could do that except maybe Kone again with their altar ropes. Um, so we had to design the service elevators half and half. So they go up about 75 floors and then you transfer to another service firefighter elevator to keep on going up. And that, this uh, is something we came up originally on Burj Khalifa. It's using elevators to evacuate the building. And you probably heard since the MGM Grand Fire in Las Vegas, you see these little signs every place in the United States. In case of fire, do not use the elevators, use the stairs. Well, after 9-11, people were scared to death to wait. So the direction has always been in the fire codes, even to this day, is during a fire, you go to an area of refuge floor and you wait for further instructions. Well, I don't know how you feel, but I, wouldn't, <laughs> I don't want to wait for further instructions. I want to get out of the building. And so the idea is using the Sky Lobby shuttles and some of the selective fire service elevators to evacuate the people in the building. And we can actually do that quite easily if we clear the elevators and then assign attendants or monitors to evacuate the people. Again, this has got approximately 5,000 permanent residents. And uh, we have subterranean, this, these are all the different sizes of the building about 2,200 automobiles, uh, 22,000 square meters of office space. The hotel is a, anywhere from 168 rooms to 200 rooms, depending on how they're configured, and it's the four seasons. And then the uh, service departments are actually used as an overflow for the hotel. So if the hotel is fully occupied and you want to put some more people up or short-term expatriate workers, you can put them in the service departments. They can pay by the day or weekly. And then the um, then we get into the residential units. And this is kind of up in the air about how many there really are. It's anywhere from 230 to 300 residential units, depending on how they're divided up in rooms. And then we have at the very top, we have the very luxury residential units, 98 rooms. And in the penthouse, we have 118 rooms that are for the royal suites and uh, other items. This is the breakdown on the number of uh, service lifts. Um, in Dubai, the um, service elevator has to be uh, capable of replacing the building transformer. That's why you see that one of the cars is um, 350 kgs with a 5,000 kg, what we call safe lift mode, so they can actually carry the building transformer and replace the cores. Uh, in the U.S., we wouldn't use an elevator that large, but that's because the uh, power company owns the transformer. And there's 40 gearless traction elevators, 23 machinimus elevators, one spire rack and pinion, and eight escalators. Total equipment costs 
far as I can guess, again, nobody will tell me what it really was, but that was our estimate, <laughs> $45 million. And it was been awarded to uh, Coney, Coney. Here's a, I'm sorry it's sideways, but the building's so tall we couldn't get it to go vertically. <laughs> it would lap over the top. And this kind of shows a breakdown of the uh, elevator cores, how you go up and then transfer and go on up. This shows the uh, same pictures that Adrian showed you. The interesting one is this, uh, this originally was going to be a helipad. And then they, uh, I think they interviewed a bunch of helicopter pilots and they all said, no way are we going to fly up there. <laughs> too, the winds are too high and there are too many vortices. But I uh, understand that they, everybody liked the design, so that's now going to be for parties and uh, weddings and things like that. Here's some of the elevating first. We'll have the longest travel elevator, and that doesn't mean that's the travel. This is the upper elevator of the service elevator. That's how high it goes up into the up into the uh, building. And then we have full stop service elevator transfers, which is a first. I think it's been done, and uh, that's due to the building height. Uh, the highest observation level will be at uh, 638 meters, but I understand that now it's closer to 652, so that's varying back and forth. And um, as I said, it'll be equipped with uh, ultra ropes from Kone, so this is this will be guaranteed their highest installation to date. And um, this will be the longest travel elevators that have equipped with lifeboat operation and evacuation mode, and the, uh, all of the gearless elevators are equipped with high wind designs, stack effect mitigation, because it's in the middle of the desert, stack effects is just the opposite of what we might find in the U.S. In other words, you're worried about losing the building air conditioning out of the building, not, not cold air coming in the ground floor. Um, and then we have uh, seismic designs, although you heard from the structural engineer that, or the uh, foundation guys, it's really not a high zone, although we've planned for that. And it's also got windage uh, mediations, which means you have shrouds on the top and the bottom, kind of bullet shaped like a nuclear submarine. And uh, we, we're making uh, them guarantee a 10 to 15 millig ride quality. That's front to back and horizontally. And this was designed so the equipment to comply with the uh, 2009 IBC. This shows a stacking diagram with the various foundation configurations. The interesting thing about this building is we, we concluded very quickly that with the, uh, with the core design, it would be very difficult to get a normal elevator in there with a rear counterweight. You probably realize that most gearless elevators have counterweights in the rear. So these are all actually designed with counterweights on the side. And that saves a lot of depth of the hoistway. I don't think a major building has ever been done like that. But Kone could accommodate it. I wouldn't say quite easily, but they did accommodate it. And uh, Adrian, one of the questions to Adrian was, how tall are we going to build? Well, there was a competing tower that was going to be designed by Nikhil in Dubai, and I understand that's been canceled, but it may come back at any minute. You never know. You never know. And then the, the uh, goal for the next one is to build a mile-high tower, which would be 5,280 feet. And then uh, there's also talk of a mile-high tower in Saudi Arabia, which would cost in excess of 20 billion U.S. dollars. That's the quote. I say, if you, if you check it out on Wikipedia, these are the kind of statistics you find. And then the two-mile tower, is that even possible? Well, I think it's probably possible. Not very likely, but it's possible. When I first got in the elevator business, I always heard that the milestone was Frank Lloyd Wright's mile-high building. And planned for, it was called the Illinois, and it was planned for Chicago. And uh, I, I had quite a bit of de uh, detail on that. And it was going to contain about uh, 18 million square feet, 
and it had a projected population of 130,000 people. And it, he didn't, uh, nobody tumbled to the fact that you really should use sky lobbies. So he had come up with a plan to have atomic powered quintuple deck elevators, which he never told us how to build them, but that, <laughs> that was the design. And so you, were, I, you would come up and park on one of five levels, and then you'd walk straight in and get on one of these five elevators. And then he, his designs, I think he was talking to Otis or somebody, but they came up with a total, total elevators of 76 for 130,000 people. I said, that's, that's not even remotely close. So I actually ran some studies based on half the population, and I came up with like 150 double deck elevators in order to do that with Sky Lobby. So he had the best of intentions, but he wasn't close on the design. And so here's the uh, building and how it was designed with the five lower levels and then the elevators would go up, make five simultaneous stops as it went up the building and then five stops as it came back down. So you can see the height of that building in relation to say Sears Tower or the World Trade Center that used to be. And this one I got out of Wikipedia also. It's a two mile high building. Which would, which would really be wild. But you can see it's basically a giant pyramid. Anyhow, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.